It's commonly said that the NDIS is a policy, a policy idea whose time has come. Well, if that is the case, then our next speaker can lay claim to being the person who designed the idea whose time has come. John Walsh has had a distinguished career running an advisory practice for PricewaterhouseCoopers. Put all, put, put all that on hold, and he put all that on hold to work for the Productivity Commission as a commissioner in designing the NDIS. The Productivity Commission's report has been a critical aspect of making the case for the scheme both in the public and private domain. Please welcome Mr John Walsh. Thank you, John. It's, it's great to see so many people here today. Doogie is a very hard act to follow, uh, and I'm not, not going to try and out Doogie Doogie. <laughs> Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we are meeting on today and to pay my respect to their elders, past and present. The Productivity Commission found that the current disability system is underfunded, unfair, fragmented, and inefficient. It also found that the economic benefits of the proposed National Disability Insurance Scheme would significantly outweigh its costs. Today, I've been asked to speak about the economic cost and benefit of the NDIS. I'm going to talk about two things. First of all, the cost of doing nothing, and secondly, the cost or benefit of bringing in the NDIS. If we do nothing. Thank you. Australia does not fare well by international standards when it comes to people with disabilities. Firstly, People with disabilities have much lower education attainment rates than comparable countries. In 2009, 25% of people with a disability aged 15 to 64 had finished year 12. This compares with more than double that, 55% of people without disabilities. This level of disadvantage does not augur well for participation of people with disabilities in employment or other social activities. Not surprisingly then, Australia has one of the lowest employment participation rates for people with a disability. We are ranked 21st out of 29 OECD countries, near the bottom of the pack. People with disabilities are only half as likely to be employed compared to people without disabilities. This compares with 60% in OECD countries or 70% considering the top eight OECD countries, which is where Australia would normally expect itself to be on most indicators. It is no surprise then that 45% of people with disabilities in Australia live below the poverty line. The average for OECD countries is only 22%, less than half of Australia's average. Hence, in Australia, the current benchmark for social participation is low, and this reflects our low investment compared to other countries. The UK invests almost double what Australia does in support for people with a disability. And because of this underfunded, rationed system, our expenditure is funnelled into high-cost crisis situations, which paradoxically lead to an even more expensive system even more rationing and worse outcomes. A false economy with little investment in early intervention and prevention and which, if left unattended, will continue to exhaust funds and cripple families. Projections of the future funding required by the disability system find that in a relatively short time, the funds demanded of the current system would exceed those recommended by the NDIS. So where is the argument of doing nothing? On the other hand, if we do support the NDIS, along the lines recommended by the Productivity Commission, if we invest in people and their potential, rather than disabilities and their restrictions, 
and at the same time we make real the national disability strategy, we can anticipate the following economic benefits. Just through employment, an additional 320,000 people with a disability employed in 2050, providing an extra $32 billion per annum, or 1% of GDP. These are numbers divide, de derived by the economic think tank, the Productivity Commission. An additional 80,000 carers freed up to return to employment, seeing a $1.5 billion increase in GDP per annum. There would be many gains across other areas of the economy. I mean, for example, in the health system, currently many people are stuck in hospital, as in hospital beds, as suitable accommodation is not available. This costs as much as $1,000 a day across 80,000 bed days per year, up to $84 million annually overall, far more than the cost of equivalent supported accommodation in the community. In the justice system, many people in jail have a mental illness, an acquired brain injury or an intellectual disability. At costs exceeding that of an appropriate care and support package in the community and with a far worse prospect of inclusion in the community and quality of life. The Productivity Commission recommended launch of the disability, National Disability Insurance Scheme in July 2014 with costs leading up to that year of $550 million and in the year of launch $900 million. The Productivity Commission could never be a cause, never be accused of being rash in its recommendations for social policy reform. It is an economic think tank. However, its findings were unequivocal. The economic benefits of introducing a national disability insurance scheme would significantly outweigh its costs. Thank you very much.